Faradiba's life unfolded like a tale from Arabian Nights. Born into a common family in Tehran, her early years glittered with promise, yet were shadowed by the devastating loss of her father. Using her intelligence and determination, she won a scholarship to study in Paris, where one fateful night, at an embassy party, she was introduced to the Shah of Iran. Their whirlwind romance and marriage seemed like a fairy tale to the outside world, complete with a luxurious horse-drawn carriage. As empress, she was adored by her nation and hailed as a champion for women's rights, enchanting world leaders such as the Kennedys, Queen Elizabeth, and even the Pope. She graced magazine covers, established museums, and was immortalized in a portrait by Andy Warhol. Yet, as the country's economy faltered, she became a target for religious fundamentalists, symbolizing Western values and excess. And her status and outspokenness on women's rights brought her into conflict with those who resisted change. As revolution consumed her country and illness ravaged her husband, she was forced to leave her homeland and throne, moving from country to country, trying to outrun the bounty placed on her and her children's heads. Her life story, rich with the beauty and complexities of the tales of Scheherazade, is a saga as old as Persia itself. Join us this week as we explore the life of the last empress of Iran. Faradiba was born in Tehran in 1938, the only child of Captain Sorab Diba and Faride Gopi. The Diba family, counting ambassadors and art collectors among its forebears, was well respected in Persian society. Her grandfather had served as the Persian ambassador to the Russian Romanov court. Farah enjoyed a relatively comfortable lifestyle, studying at both Italian and French schools in Iran's capital. However, her idyllic childhood was marred by the untimely death of her father, with whom she was especially close. His cancer diagnosis had been hidden from her to spare her worry, so his death came as a great shock leaving her devastated. The reduced financial circumstances caused her family to move into a cramped apartment with her uncle and his family. A gifted student and athlete, Farah found solace in school and sports, excelling in both. Her team won the Tehran Basketball Championship three years in a row. Before his death, Sorab had instilled in his daughter a love of the French language and culture. From her mother, she inherited a streak of independence and forward thinking. Faride refused to make her daughter wear a veil and, far from arranging her marriage, encouraged her to study architecture in Paris on a scholarship. There she excelled, immersing herself in the culture of Paris, visiting museums and exhibitions. Paris was a place where I could truly immerse myself in the arts and culture. It was an eye-opening experience that shaped my worldview and deepened my appreciation for beauty and creativity, she later recalled. Described by her classmates as a hard worker who studied well into the night and never cut class, Farah Diba took a rare break from her studies in the spring of 1959 to attend an embassy reception organized in honor of the Shah's visit to Paris. Farah, along with other Iranian students studying in France, was invited to attend. In the luminous city of Paris, beneath the gilded chandeliers of an embassy hall, Faradiba's destiny took a fateful turn. There, amidst the glittering elite, she met the King of Kings. Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, with his mournful eyes and regal bearing, was immediately captivated by the 21-year-old beauty. Farah, with a courage that belied her commoner status, dared to voice her concerns about the reduction of scholarship funding a plight affecting many Iranian students abroad. I wrote a letter to my mother saying he has such beautiful eyes, but very sad eyes, she later recalled, the melancholy of his gaze etched in her memory. This serendipitous encounter blossomed into a royal romance, defying the chasm of their 19-year age difference and the shadows of Muhammad's two failed marriages. The Shah's first union with Princess Fazia, daughter of King Fuad of Egypt, had been a grand spectacle, uniting two great Muslim lands. Fireworks once lit the skies over the Nile as they celebrated their nuptials, but the union faltered when Fazia failed to produce a male heir, prompting her return to Egypt. His second marriage to Princess Saraya, a daughter of Iran's powerful Bakhtiari family, 
was marked by deep affection, but marred by tragedy, as she too could not bear children. Soraya's heartbreak echoed through the annals of French chansons, inspiring Françoise Malajoris's Je veux pleurer comme Soraya, I want to cry like Soraya. Her tears were eventually dried by a lavish settlement, including a Rolls Royce, a 22.37 carat diamond engagement ring, and a sumptuous Parisian apartment. The Shah, despite the end of their marriage, maintained a poignant correspondence with Soraya until his death. Within months of their initial encounter, the Shah proposed to Farah. Their engagement was celebrated with great pomp at the Golestan Palace in Tehran, a dazzling spectacle that captured the world's attention. The union of the Shah and the commoner Farah was heralded as a modern fairy tale, enchanting a nation and beyond. The Shah himself later reflected, I knew as soon as we met that she was the woman I had been waiting for so long as well as the queen my country needed. This statement, rich with both personal and national significance, marked the beginning of an extraordinary journey. One that would see Farah ascend to the heights of imperial splendor and endure the depths of exile and loss. Their wedding took place in December 1959, just 11 months after they met, and was a grand affair held at the Marble Palace in Tehran. The ceremony, conducted according to Shiite Muslim traditions, was a spectacle of opulence and elegance. On her head rested a Harry Winston creation, a four-pound tiara crowned with the 60-carat pink Noral Ain, Eye of Light Diamond, one of the largest in the world. Yves Saint Laurent designed the wedding gown, adorned with a fur-lined hem and a touch of blue for good luck. In a gesture symbolizing joy and freedom, the bride set 150 caged nightingales free, their flight a testament to the occasion's significance. Wherever Farah Deba went in Iran, she was greeted with cheers, and many Iranian women saw her story as a real-life Cinderella tale. Less than a year later, she gave birth to a son and heir, Crown Prince Reza. An honor guard marked the moment by firing their guns, and there was dancing in the streets. A second son, Prince Ali Reza, and daughters, Princess Farinaz and Princess Layla, followed. Among other lavish perks, the children enjoyed a private zoo filled with deer, antelope, monkeys, lions, and an Indian elephant, a gift from Indira Gandhi. The Shah was a complicated man. On one hand, he believed in the divine right of kings, while on the other, he strove to modernize his country. As part of his white revolution, he worked to emancipate women, improve literacy, grant rights to minorities, allow freedom of religion, and elevate the nation's living standards. At the same time, he was an authoritarian ruler who lived a lavish life while many in rural areas still languished in poverty. As his reign progressed, he ousted many of his opponents and refused to give the developing middle class a voice in the country's affairs. Despite becoming Shah in 1941, he did not hold his formal coronation ceremony until 1967. This delay was due to the war and the instability Iran faced afterward, including a coup in 1953, where he needed the help of nobles and the USA to regain power. He decided that, in addition to naming himself King of Kings, he would name Farah Empress, making her the first Persian Empress ever. This meant that should the Shah die before their son came of age, she would be head of state, a role not given to a woman in 2,500 years of Persian history. Many in Iran and around the world celebrated this unprecedented move. For Farah, a new crown was commissioned from the renowned Parisian jeweler Van Cleef & Arpels. This crown was an awe-inspiring masterpiece, symbolizing the grandeur of the Pahlavi dynasty. Additionally, a lavish coronation coach was specially ordered for the ceremony. Made in Vienna by Josef Klickmann, the coach was flown to Tehran and assembled there. This blue and gold carriage, a replica of the Austrian imperial carriage used by the Habsburgs, was one of the most criticized expenses due to the existing carriage used by the Shah's father. However, the result was undeniably magnificent. The gilded crown atop the carriage and the imperial family's coat of arms in gold on the door made it a spectacular sight. The ceremony, held in the opulent Golestan Palace, was broadcast around the world, showcasing the splendor and tradition of the Iranian monarchy. As Empress, Farah was not merely a figurehead. 
She traveled extensively, spending time at the White House, where she and Jackie Kennedy bonded over their shared love of Parisian culture and art. At Buckingham Palace, she impressed Queen Elizabeth with her grace and poise. In the Vatican, she discussed the role of faith with Pope Paul VI, and in Paris, Charles de Gaulle called her one of the most charming and intelligent first ladies he had ever met. At home, Empress Farah worked tirelessly for women's education and social welfare. She was the patron of 24 organizations dedicated to improving the lives of Iranians. She donated blood on television in a bid to inspire other women to do the same and established the first self-sustaining leper colony personally visiting its residents. In 1971, the Shah held a celebration to mark the 2,500-year anniversary of the Persian Empire in the ancient city of Persepolis. It was a dazzling display of opulence and cultural grandeur. The celebration drew 70 leaders from around the world, including Queen Elizabeth, Princess Grace, and the Prime Minister of Japan. Celebrities such as Elizabeth Taylor, Audrey Hepburn, Peter Sellers, and socialites like Babe Paley, Gloria Guinness, Gloria Vanderbilt, and Jackie Kennedy Onassis also attended. The event featured luxurious banquets catered from Parisian restaurants, with food and wine served in exquisite Baccarat crystal goblets. The centerpiece of the celebration was the grand banquet held in a specially constructed tent city at Persepolis, where guests dined on tables adorned with Persian silk and gold. Even the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra was flown in to perform. The Empress, resplendent in a stunning gown and adorned with priceless jewels, epitomized grace and elegance as she hosted the illustrious guests, symbolizing the union of ancient Persian splendor with contemporary sophistication. The event was broadcast around the world and was the most expensive banquet in modern history, costing $120 million, a significant amount at that time. While the celebration showcased Iran in a glowing light globally, many suffering citizens saw it as underscoring the stark economic disparity and highlighting the Shah's detachment from the daily struggles of ordinary people. Critics argued that the celebration's resources could have been better allocated to address pressing social needs and improve living conditions. This event, emblematic of the regime's excesses and autocratic rule, fueled growing discontent and played a role in galvanizing support for the revolutionary movement. To the outside world, Farah and Reza had the perfect marriage, but he was a serial philanderer, having affairs with models and actresses both in Iran and around the world. When the affairs became known in the mid-70s, it further added to the public's growing discontent with the Shah's rule, as they were seen as further evidence of his detachment and moral hypocrisy. However, despite the strain, Farah continued to support her husband both publicly and privately. She believed she had an important role to play in the country's future, and any divorce would lead to her having limited access to the children and losing her influence. Even years later, in her autobiography, she speaks of her deep love and affection for the Shah, saying our love was deep and enduring. Even in the face of adversity, we found strength in each other. Empress Farah played a pivotal role in founding the Tehran Museum of Contemporary Art, where she assembled one of the greatest collections of art outside Europe. The masterpieces included works by impressionists like Monet and Renoir, with an estimated cost of $100 million. Today, the gallery, which houses works by Toulouse-Lautrec, Picasso, Dali, Pollock, and Liechtenstein, is valued at $3 billion. During its construction, she met Salvador Dali, Marc Chagall, and Henry Moore. In 1976, Empress Farah commissioned Andy Warhol to paint her portrait. About his commission, he wrote, I had the best time. It was just so up there, so glamorous. She was really, really kind and so beautiful. During their reign, Frank Sinatra and Yehudi Menuhin performed, and theaters screened Midnight Cowboy. Although many applauded her liberalism, others blamed Farah Deba and her westernization for the rise of Ayatollah Khomeini, a man who hated the monarchy and blamed them for the murder of his father when he was just five. The public mood shifted, and she was seen as a figure more akin to Marie Antoinette than Cinderella. 
The Shah's white revolution alarmed conservative Iranians who feared that imported films, clothes, and customs endangered their Islamic faith. When the economy weakened in 1977, the simmering discontent became a flood that threatened to wash away the monarchy. Mohammad Reza Pahlavi used the Savak, his dreaded secret police, to brutally quell dissent. The Shah was also dealing with cancer and found it difficult on certain days to even rise from his bed. Queen Farah advised him to leave the country for treatment, saying she would quell the revolution. However, the Shah refused, saying it would make him look weak, especially if he left a woman in charge. By late 1978, Iran was in a state of widespread unrest and civil disorder. Protests against the Shah's regime had grown significantly in size and intensity, involving millions of Iranians. Many of his former allies and advisors began to distance themselves from the regime. On January 16, 1979, Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi and Empress Farah left Iran, ostensibly for a vacation, but they would never be able to go home again. The revolutionary government had ordered the execution of the Shah and his family. Ousted from the Marble Palace, they became royal refugees. The Pahlavis embarked on a desperate odyssey. Every country that opened their doors to the pair received a barrage of threats from enraged Islamic radicals. In desperation, they became royals in search of asylum. They went first to Egypt, then to Morocco as guests of King Hassan II, then to the Bahamas, and then Mexico. They headed to the Caribbean, where they were granted temporary refuge in the Bahamas on Paradise Island. The Shah offered to buy the island for $425 million, but the officials rejected his offer. Despite rumors that the Shah and Farah had escaped with billions of dollars and were known to be generous, old friends turned their backs in fear. Farah wrote of the days when she had to eat the bitter bread of banishment. People change when you are not in power. I lived hour to hour, day to day, but I had to survive for my children. You can lose your position, your possessions, your country, your loved ones, but you shouldn't lose your dignity or your courage. She even received a letter informing her that if she were to kill the Shah, she would be welcomed back to the country. In tears, she tore up the letter. In 1979, they came to the United States for Muhammad's cancer treatment. His wife had been kept in the dark over his illness, a cruel echo of what had transpired with her father. In fury at America for helping the Shah, 13 days later, Militant Iranian Muslims invaded the U.S. Embassy in Tehran and took hostages, demanding the Shah's extradition, the return of his plundered wealth, and a confession of American crimes in Iran. Upon his release from the hospital, Mexico blocked his return. The family went to Panama and then departed once more to Cairo, where Muhammad died at age 60, a king without a country. Farah's fairy tale life was turning into a tragedy, and more was to follow. With Muhammad's death, President Sadat granted the devastated widow asylum and the use of the Kuba Palace in Cairo. But his assassination the next year ended this refuge. At this juncture, President Reagan told them they were welcome in the United States, where the family finally settled in the upscale town of Greenwich, Connecticut. Farah had been extremely worried about her youngest daughter, Princess Layla, who suffered from low self-esteem, even though her beauty had led her to walk the Parisian catwalks as a Valentino model. Among her afflictions were anorexia, depression, and insomnia. Her mother's friend discovered Layla's emaciated body in a 500 pound per night London hotel room. Her death was the result of an overdose of prescription drugs and cocaine. In the nightstand was a photograph of her family watching television in their palace in Tehran. Layla's funeral was held in Paris. In attendance were members of the French royal family and her mother, her face etched in grief. Ali Reza had been extremely close to his sister as well, and her passing cast a lingering shadow over his life. He had received his bachelor's degree from Princeton and a master's degree from Columbia, and was studying for his PhD at Harvard. His credentials had earned him the designation of being one of the world's most eligible princes. Despite his privileged life, in 2011, Ali ended his own life with a shotgun in his Boston home. 
His final wish was for his ashes to be scattered in the Caspian Sea. Seven months later, his girlfriend gave birth to their daughter, Iriana Layla. Farah recognized her as a full member of their family and as a princess of Iran. Faradiba Pahlavi, the survivor of many storms, lives alone in a vast Parisian apartment. The floors display fine silk rugs, there are displays of Persian antiquities and pictures from her extraordinary life. Exile is very hard, she has said. In her memoir, she recalls her lost land as a paradise. She also dismisses the torture and murder committed by the Savak secret police. However, she does concede that Mohammed's desire for modernization was too far-reaching for a country mired in the Middle Ages, that his rule was too authoritarian, and that perhaps we should have been more humble. Despite being widowed at 41, she has never remarried and remains an outspoken critic of the current Iranian regime, especially their treatment of women. I have always believed in the strength and resilience of Iranian women. Despite the oppressive measures, they continue to fight for their rights and dignity. I hope that one day, Iran will be free and women will regain their rightful place in society. Every year, Farah visits her husband's tomb in the Al Rifai Mosque in Cairo. She remembers him as an adoring husband, a memory that contrasts with less laudatory accounts. I remember him as a loving husband and a dedicated leader. His love for me and for Iran was unwavering. Today she writes, speaks on women's issues in Iran, and finds solace in her enduring love and the poetry of Hafiz, always believing that one day she will go home again. As the Empress of Iran, she stood as a symbol of grace and modernity, her life a dazzling dance of opulence and duty. Yet, this shimmering dream was shattered by the storm of revolution and the relentless tide of loss. Exiled from her homeland, she faced the haunting shadows of grief with the deaths of her beloved husband and children carving deep lines of sorrow into her soul. Despite these profound trials, her spirit remains unbroken. In her twilight years, she reflects on a life that, while marred by tragedy, is also illuminated by the enduring light of love and memory. Her words resonate with timeless wisdom. The seeds you plant in love never perish. I hope you enjoyed this week's story on Farah Deba, the last Empress of Persia. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Please like, share, and subscribe for more. It really helps keep the channel going. And as always, thanks for watching.